Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, and we are reading in Mark, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 24 and reading through verse 37. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician or of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and said to her, and he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And so she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee, in in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him a deaf man who had, been in, had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put the fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephratha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them not to tell, excuse me, Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, yes, this is not your average passage in the Gospels. Yes, the exchange between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman is at best shocking to us, and perhaps even a little offensive. But rather than getting bogged down in the details of this exchange and all the theories revolving around it, let's step back for a moment and look at the bigger picture of what it should mean to us as we read it. First, let's understand something. Jesus is traveling in what is basically a Gentile territory. There are Jews present, but most of the people he is meeting there are not Jewish. They know little, if anything, about the Jewish Messiah. And they care even less about the religious politics of Jewish Galilee and Jerusalem. Into the setting comes Jesus. Whether he is sightseeing in the region or trying to get a break from the crowds in Galilee or he's trying to hide from Jewish authorities or he's just simply out to seek and reach out to those pockets of Jewish settlers in the region, none of that really matters in this setting. So much as the fact that up to this point, Jesus has been concentrating his message and his preaching and his healing on the Jews of Galilee. Now, a reasonable person might assume that Jesus might get some rest here in a foreign region. But it is not to be so. Even here, in the Gentile region to the north, the people, Jews and Gentiles alike, know his name and know his reputation. And so they seek out Jesus and his healing touch. It's worth noting here that in both these stories, it is not the person who needs healed that reaches out to Jesus. It is a mother, and it is the friends of the man who needs healing that come to Jesus on their behalf. It is not the faith of the victims that brings healing, but rather it is the faith and the persistence of the others that bring the miracle to fruition. And so in reading this, we, fear, we hear ourselves being charged 
of this word to likewise be diligent in our own appeals to God and Christ on behalf of others. It's easy for us to play, pray for what we need and what we want. But what Jesus is saying to us here in this gospel is that we need to think about the needs of others, to lift up their concerns before God and before Christ, to seek healing for others, not just for ourselves. Moreover, it's easier to give up on praying even before we start, feeling that either we or the person in need really isn't worthy of God's attention. But nothing could be further from the truth. We presume that both of these people being healed are Gentiles and would have been considered by many to be unworthy even to approach Jesus. And yet they did with conviction and faith and determination. When it comes to praying for the needs of others, we should strive for the same attitude and faith in Jesus' power to heal that we see here in this woman and in these friends of the deaf man. And more importantly, we need to probably widen the scope of our efforts to pray. Which brings us back to Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. It is a bit of a shock to find Jesus being so short with this woman. After all, though she is a Gentile, she is also a mother, one who is becoming desperate for the healing of her child. And yet here Jesus essentially calls her and her daughter dogs. It is the insult we imagine it to be. Why Jesus seems to be so offensive is a rather lengthy and confusing subject for us. But what is clear here is that Jesus is reminding her and us that at this point in his ministry, his primary mission is to his own people, the children of Israel. He did not come to preach among the Gentiles first, but only to the lost sheep of Israel. However, Even in these words, we seem to hear here that there will be a point in time when the message of Jesus Christ will be intended to go out to all of the world to include even the Gentiles. But that time has not yet come. However, the woman will not be dissuaded. She realizes that being a Gentile, she is unworthy to be in the presence of this, this venerated rabbi. And yet she reminds him in that, those very subtle words, as I was reminded recently, that even the dogs under the table get the crumbs from the children. She recognizes that though she is not a mo- one of the family, she belongs in the household. And so her faith compels her to reach out to Jesus for even the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus rewards her wit and her determination with the healing of her daughter. So what is that to us? His words, let the children be fed first, is essentially saying, let charity begin at home. Which is a phrase that far too many of us like far too much and mostly for all the wrong reasons do we apply it. It It's a phrase that means a lot to us, but here it is essentially saying that her insistence and Jesus' granting of her request challenges us now to ask of ourselves, who are the people we serve first and subsequently? Should we be looking beyond our own little group and family when we seek to serve? Should we look at those who are beyond our socioeconomic class? Should we be looking at those who are beyond our ethnicity? Should we be looking at those beyond our geographic boundaries for people to minister to in the name of Jesus Christ? Mark, I believe, is quite clearly calling us to look beyond to the people who we most conveniently overlook and minister to them. And when we do so, it must be with a heart and an effort that is more than simply tossing them some crumbs. 
Just as Jesus came offering himself as the bread of life, inviting us to share in this feast that we will partake today, so should we be determined to invite others to this table of God. Not with the half-hearted leftover crumbs with no effort, but with the zeal of this woman and these friends who prayed and pleaded with Jesus. After all, this is the calling of our lives as the people of God. There are plenty of children in our midst of all ages who are in need of God's word. But I ask you, are our children worthy of so much more than the people who are beyond those doors? When given the opportunity to share the bread of life with others, should we only brush off the crumbs of the table to those others? Would not such an attitude essentially call those beyond our doors dogs? who are not worthy to sit beside us at the Lord's table? Is that really who we want to be? And so it leads us back to that constant question. Are we really striving to make others welcome in our midst? Are we content to treat them as those who only get the crumbs. Sharing the bread of life goes beyond caring for those who wander through those doors in our midst. Sharing the bread of life means sharing it with others, sharing with others what we have experienced as believers. We cannot overlook the fact that while Jesus may have had his reasons for asking those he healed to remain silent, the joy of their interaction and their healing compelled them to share their stories of salvation. Jesus sought to hide from the people, but could not because his reputation continued to spread because even though they were called to keep silent, they could not stand but to share what joy they had found. We gather here each week as those who have come to believe in Jesus Christ. Thank God. We gather here as the members of the body of Christ. And so I have to believe that there is something that you have seen or heard or experienced that brings you back to this place. Something that has brought you to cling to the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Whatever that glimpse of the kingdom of heaven whatever that experience of God's love and mercy and healing or truth that you have witnessed, you must be prepared to share it even with those beyond the doors. The spread of Jesus' reputation, as read here in Mark's Gospel, should encourage us to do likewise focusing our attention on all that God has done for us and is doing in our lives even now and that of the lives of those around us as we lead others into the kingdom of heaven. The children that we pledged to nurture in baptism as we did last Sunday evening, the ones that we claim to love enough to provide for their needs, can only learn of God and how God works in this world if we, having experienced that love of God for ourselves, are willing, each one of us, to step forward and speak to them about our experiences of salvation in Jesus Christ. And the children of God that we have not yet met 
friends, have every right and perhaps even a greater need for this good news which we have so readily accepted and experienced. The good news that we so readily, if not greedily, keep to ourselves. You know what it means to you to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I presume to believe that you know what God has done for you it was not meant for you alone. It is not a secret to keep, but it is good news to share, to share here among each other that we may encourage each other, but to share out there beyond the doors among all those lost ones, those lost children of God who now today, as never before, so desperately need to hear it. Do not keep it to yourselves. And do not simply dust the crumbs of the Lord's table off into their laps. But openly and willingly and with the same zeal of this woman and these friends of a deaf man, share it with those who are in need. Amen.